I would like to welcome you to the 15th class in the UBC Ecosystem Modeling course, uh, FISH 501. And today is going to be about uh, two tutorials about value chain and uh, fleet dynamics. And uh, I would like to start off by recognizing that UBC is at the Coast Salish territory. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm talking to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the uh, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. And uh, I would also remind you that uh, recordings are available on the Ecopart YouTube channel and the Facebook page. And finally also that uh, there is a course website where you can find what's going to happen and lectures and tutorials and so on will be there. Uh, so uh, today we're going to be working with value chains one more time and let's see what we've got. And you should see on your on the left the anchovy bay model and to my right the PDF with the tutorial. Is that what you see guys? Yeah, it works fine. Okay, so the first thing that we want to see is that we want to acknowledge that uh, people's livelihoods and health and 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 jobs and, and, and food security matters. So we are trying to attach a value chain to our anchovy bay model. So I start going to the Ecopath input model parameters. And one of the first things that I notice is that the model area is not defined. So we know that we have a hundred square kilometers in anchovy bay. Also, the we, we are working in, well, or at least I think that anchovy bay is somewhere in Europe. So Maybe instead of using the US, we should use the Euro. And you can change the currency uh, here as well, where it states monetary units. Right? So those two things are perhaps the what, what we should start with. Then another thing that we want to look at is our off-vessel prices. And uh, and to do that, it's, it's good to go to Ecopath, Input Fishery, and off-vessel prices. And you will see here that we have the off-vessel prices for the previous tutorial, but these are a bit outdated. So like I went to to the European Trade Association webpage yesterday and got a lot of off-vessel prices. So for example, well, I didn't get any for seals, but I saw that, oh, Billy, I am getting your keyboard really loud. So could you please mute? Yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. So one thing that you will see is that uh, I, I couldn't find a price for an official price for sealers, but I found one of Namibia. So let's use that one, which is something like 600 euros per ton. But for cod, we know that it's about uh, 1400 per ton. Uh, whiting, we know it should be around 200. Then we know that mackerel should be 350. And then anchovies should be one. 160 but we also know that when they're caught by bait boats they have slightly better quality so let's put 180 and then for shrimpers that's somewhere around 1700 so this is something more realistic then the next thing that we should do is go to ecopath but now Sorry, not... um, Santiago, yeah. did you mean 1700 or 17,000 17,000 yeah well, do I, do I have three zeros, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like you can see that cod is valuable. Shrimp is super valuable. Anchovies are not that valuable. And mackerels are in the middle. But uh, yeah. So this this is uh, a, a more accurate representation of the spread of value in for these functional groups. So the next thing that, 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 that we do is we go to Ecopath. Oh, output. And then we check that our model is balanced. And well... It is because this is what I downloaded from Billy. And then we can go to dun, 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 output and we start with a value chain. The first thing is go to, oh, yeah, to parameters and click run with Ecopath. If you were doing this uh, with Ecosim or with other plugins, it's, it's it, you would highlight them here. And you can also select the level of aggregation in, in, in your runs. Unaggregated is the fastest, and we can later change these kind of things in, in, in a bit. So just leave it with the default. 
And then the next thing that we do is we go to the flow. And in the flow, you will get uh, a space which is pretty empty. And what you can do uh, is go and add and put here, oh, create producers for fleets. So what this does is this gets you for each, uh, for each fishing fleet that you have listed as in Ecopath, it will create a box that represents a producer, right? If, as you can see, you can, you can find a, a lot of them here, but like this is not organized at all. So like I like using grids and you can arrange them by clicking arrange and then clicking yes. And this will do this, but as we're going to build stuff with some space, let's add some space in between just to, uh, I mean, feel free to pray or play around. Okay. So now we have our basic, uh, producers and we need to add a couple more things, which are processors, distributors, wholesalers, retailers, and consumers. I've color coded them here and you can you can add them just as you added the the, the the processor, the producers, I'm sorry. One thing that is worth noting is that to, here we'll have a command table where we can change things and for, for, for each of, of, of the enterprises. You can add costs, you can add ratios, you can add a lot of information directly here. But I'll show you how to add that information in a bit. So let's see. Let's add a, a couple more, uh, let's add some processors. So what we would do is add a processor. And one thing that you will see is, oh, sorry. I, I made a mistake and I added a producer, not a processor. So one thing that we can do uh, uh, is click here. Oh, we can delete this. Yep. And now let's add a processor. Okay, one thing that you'll see is that all producers have kind of like a hook and all processors have a tiny little factory here. So that can help us out. You can also do this directly through the shortcuts, uh, but let's, let's do this for now manually, right? So here you'll find one processor and you can change the name of the processor directly here. So I double click in there and let's say that this is a primary processor. So these guys are the ones that will be filleting the fish and, 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 and packaging it into portions. And we also have another processor that is a cannery. And for that, we can go here again. And we have one more, which is a freezing plant. And finally, we have one for the pelts, which it's called the ABC, the Anchovy Bay Company that works with pelts. Okay, so these are our processors. And now we need to add the different uh, distributors. So we do the same thing. Oh, we go and add distributors. And I know that we have three here. Please, if I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know. I know that we have one that is called coolers. We have another one that's called trucks. We've got another one that's called frozen trucks. Right, uh, frost trucks. Okay, and then let's see what else we've got. You'll see here again that we have some cars instead of, or some trucks instead of some factories, right? That denotes that they are uh, distributors. So the zoom is a bit high, so let's, like you can change the zoom to by using this button here. So now let's add 
some wholesalers. And then I know we have a warehouse. And the other one is fresh seafood wholesalers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then for retailers, we have three again which would be so one thing that it's worth noting is that when you make a mistake in creating anything other than a fleet you can convert it by clicking on on on, on converting to a different enterprise so let's see that this retailer here I want to convert it into wholesaler and you just say yes and you will see it has converted it into wholesaler here the icon has changed but let's do it again and turn it back into a retail like this that's what we need here but uh as you can see the only things that we cannot convert are fleets if that's if, if you've got an issue with those or you make a mistake with those you just delete them and try again so our retailers are three and Another way, another place where we can change this this information is in in the components tables, but we will deal with those in a bit. So our retailers are uh, restaurants. Then we have we have um, supermarkets. And we have fishmongers. And then we have consumers. And our consumers are three kind of consumers. So we have tourists. We have local consumers. I'm sorry for that sound over there. The cat is really lively today. And the final one is regional. Okay, as you can see, we've got a, quite a messy picture here and we need to link these guys. And to do that, I like to arrange them as a flow where we keep at the same level, the, the, the same kind of enterprises, right? So in here, distributors, we would keep them together pretty much around the same area and the Different retailers, we keep them together as well. And we could also do this with the consumers. Okay, so now we have to link these guys. As you can see, everything that is in purple uh, means that it's not properly linked. To link something, you need to first click move and then click link. But let's see what we're linking. So we know here that Shrimpers, strollers, and sayers sell their catch to primary processors. So let's go and with links. We go here to primary processor because that's shrimper. Then we have trollers and we have sayers. Sell their catch to primary processors. Then we have sayers and bait boats to canneries. So bait boats to canneries and sayers to canneries. And then we have trawlers to freezing plants and sealers to the ABC. One thing that you'll notice is that trawlers and saners are both highlighted red. That's because we haven't defined how their catch flows 
between the two different uh, processors that they supply. But let's first finish with the links and then we can go the rest of the way. So primary processors, go to coolers, canneries, go to trucks, freezing plants, go to frost trucks. Now we know that coolers send their catch to fresh seafood wholesalers and fresh seafood wholesalers then supply uh, restaurants. Oh, okay. That's when you double click uh, an enterprise. So you can't link an enterprise to itself. So it does not allow loops. So fresh goes to restaurants. And this also goes to fishmongers. And then we have warehouses to supermarkets. I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, I'm sorry. And we know that restaurants are supplying the tourists, fishmongers are supplying the locals. Uh, okay, and now for the rest, we know that trucks, uh, go to warehouses. They sell to supermarkets and supermarkets sell to locals as well as regionals. And then we know that frost trucks go to warehouses and that the ABC directly sells to regional consumers. Okay, so this is pretty much the flow of our value chain. As you can see, there's it's quite messy and we can try to rearrange it to better suit our needs. But uh, there was one more bit here that the trucks are a company that does not purchase the, the, the canneries production. They charge a fee for the service of delivering the product to the warehouse that needs it. So they pretty much act like a broker here. So we can set that also here. Uh, when we go to trucks and we look at Let's see if it does it right. Okay, so here we will see broker and let's see if I can get a better sign here. Nope. So let's do that in the other place. Let's just go move again. And we'll see that in a bit, but here. When you click on broker, it gets you an option to say true or false. We are setting that a true here for the trucks. Right? I'm sorry, this doesn't show well. We can also check information of these guys in components. When we go to the different uh, enterprise types here, we have produ producers, processors, wholesalers. If we click in any of those, we will see, for example, the different uh, processors, uh, producers here. These are the names of the fleet. And the Ecopath fleet number corresponds here. As you can see, all of them are, are not brokers. And here the biomass ratios are expressed as, uh, as how much goes from one to the next. We'll deal with that in a bit. But you can see that there is a bunch of different cost items and none of them are filled. And that is okay for now. But uh, when we go to the different distributors, you will see that trucks has been labeled as true as a broker here. The thing is, it is important when we deal with, with, with this kind of enterprises because broker is, some, is someone that's, that's, that does not uh, take risk in purchasing the seafood. I mean, they just place your seafood somewhere, right? And this is common in distribution, particularly for exports. When you are starting a new market and you want uh, to place some frozen tuna in an African country or, or, or an Asian country, and your company does not have a flow, you might hire uh, a broker to place that production elsewhere, right? But now let's go to, to how we actually describe what's happening between the flows, right? So one really cool thing that you can do here is that when you click on the, on the enterprise, you will get a lot of information here on this panel, right? But you can also click on the link and when you click on the link, it gives you information about the biomass ratio, the, bio, the value ratio. And if, for example, trawlers that land more than one species, you will get both of the species here. 
and you will see their value ratios. And you can click, for example, in whiting, and it will give you uh, an indication of their value ratio as well. I mean, I, I really don't like inputting values here because sometimes it's messy and it's easier to copy and paste this kind of stuff from an Excel spreadsheet, which is something that you will also be able to find here from, from the table. So we go to landings and you will see that the biomass ratios and value ratios are all set to one. So what this is saying is that all of the landings of seals caught by sealers go to the ABC and it goes at the same value as the all vessel price that we have on, on the Ecopath input. So one thing that you can do is just copy this and once you have that, you can just select this again and paste it. And now you have updated your, your table. One thing that you will notice is that the primary processors now, for example, trollers, when they, okay, there's a, an easier way to navigate this. Let's say that you want to deal with caught. Caught is caught by trollers. And now what we're saying is that it's caught by trollers going Half of it goes to primary processors and half of it goes to freezing plants. And for, yeah, Billy, sorry. Santiago, uh, did I miss it when I was trying to get Facebook Live working? Or did you define biomass ratio and value ratio? No, you, you did not miss it. So in, in this case, value, the biomass ratio uh, is, is... Let's see it on the flowchart. Okay. So, okay. So here, for example, for trollers, right? Trollers, oh, I have lost my ability to click on things. Oh, good. I thought I could oh. confuse you. I could, yes. Oh, thank you, Billy, as always. Okay, so what? let's say here, saners. Saners are catching two things. Uh, they're catching mackerels and anchovies. But what we're telling the, the model here with the biomass ratio is that half of the, of the mackerel landings go to primary processors. And you can see that there's another line here that goes to canneries. And we're telling the model that the other half of, 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 of it goes to, to the canneries. And here you're applying a value ratio of 0.8. This value ratio is a multiplier that we are applying it to the value of inputs. So for the for this particular case, we are telling that when we're sending, um, let's say, mackerel from Saners to the cannery, it will apply a value ratio of 0.8 that is multiplied to the off-vessel price that we inputted here in off-vessel price. So it will be 0.8 times 350. So in this way, we can parameterize uh, how different uh, enterprises will value the catch in a different way. So if you want, for example, the best quality of fish, you might be uh, inclined to pay more for it. So you can use those multipliers here. When we apply value ratios on the rest of the, of the system, so everything after the, the, the producers, this lets us know how much of the value is, is, is like how much of the, what's increase in value of products in respect to the value of inputs. So if, if it increased seven times, we put a value ratio of seven. It's best to use actually the value per ton, but not, we, we we're not always have that information. But uh, let's, let's, let's look at the tutorial before I'm, I continue running. One thing that you that 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 we saw at the beginning uh, was that we had some some like both trollers and 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 saners were 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 colored, and and that is an issue that normally happens when we have not defined them. So let's say that we can grab a fleet like sealers. It will tell you everything that you need. It'll just summarize this here in the landings. So this this table. Uh, allows you to, to to filter where you are sending your flows from the processor from the producers to the processors. In here, we have trollers. Trollers catch caught and whiting, and they send half of it to primary processors and half of it to freezing plants. If we have an issue here, let's say that we 
purposely put a one here and a 1.5 and we go back to the flow, it will, it, it will highlight it and it will show us that we've made a mistake, that there is too much fish that is being sent somewhere rather than, than so like we're exceeding our, 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 our flow, right? And, and, and this is kind of like a, a, an alert that we have to keep track of. So let's go back here and we were dealing with trawlers and we know that this is again 0.5. So, so far we have information on, on who are the, pro, the, 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 the processors and the structure of the chain and where the fish goes as it moves across the chain. We have the values of the, of, of, of the off vessel prices and we have some basic understanding of the value ratios for each species as it goes from one place to the next. This is enough to run the value chain. This is pretty basic. This is just a skeleton of the chain. So if you want to do that, you can go to run value chain. And again, here I've selected an aggregated and we just go run ecopath. And it will tell you how many tons we have in the different places. So this is again, everything that goes to producers is sent to processing that is sent to distribution and it then goes to wholesaler and then goes to retail in tons. This makes a little sense here. And this should be, a, 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 should pop up in your face. We expect that as we move from producers to retailers, we should have a decreasing amount of biomass, less tons, right? As, as we lose uh, products based on like, for example, if we are, if you're canning tuna, we will see the guts and the heads and the, that, that, that are discarded, right? Or used for fish meal production, but they will not move to the next stage of distribution, right? So this, why this is happening is because when we look at our flow, oh, and one thing that we can do here, which is another interesting thing, we can put show flow. And when we, we can interpret this through here. And what we're seeing is that, Many are are many groups are recombining what they're what they're selling back to the to to to. Oh, I'm sorry. So why do we have more fish in the wholesalers? Because we are sending all the catch that is going from different groups to the distributors back to the wholesalers. So there is no loss here. Another thing that we can see is that we have value, and the value the product value. Is, 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 is increasing as we go through the chain, but there's more value in production than in processing. And then there's more value in wholesale. Another thing that we, we can, can track is the revenue because we don't have any costs and we can track as how the revenue is increasing and what's the difference between the total revenue and the revenue that comes from producers. This difference is the multiplier, right? So here's pretty much, we have uh, six for every one that we do in on land so like this is a is, is a big multiplier for this value chain here again we only have costs for processing onwards because the only cost that is allocated is the cost of buying the fish and we don't have any information about jobs or dependents or anything of that sort but it's this is this is how like we start looking at the different value chains and one thing that we can do again is also search by enterprise. So like, for example, we can look at each individual enterprise just by looking at what, where they are at and what they're contributing. So if we had costs and, and, and profit, we, 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 we can know what's the total utility for a particular wholesaler, right? And, and this is, for example, we consumers don't add anything to the chain, they're just, there to, 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 to feed on your value chain, right? But you have everything here. And you can also run this uh, aggregated by fleet, for example. So you just go there and say run, and now you will have the different fleets. So we can say what happens to the value chain of trawlers and how does that differ to the value chain of saners or bait boats, right? And you can do the same thing and run it by group and what we'll see is that we have what's the contribution of seals to the anchovy bay economy versus what's the contribution of shrimp right big numbers where they are at and that's how we trace things
But now let's add a little bit more realism to the thing. And we can add that by adding some information about the, the, the different flows from the processors onwards. So on the Excel spreadsheet, on the second tab, you'll have links. And what you can do is just select the links and copy the biomass ratio all the way here. And we go to components, go to links, and we just paste them. Now we have some information about these things. And when we run it, we can go back and run the chain. So with this, our numbers have changed a lot. And now we have information, we, we, we can see again that there's less production that ends up going to the retailer and that would probably go to the consumer. We, we have an issue with the wholesalers because we still are moving a lot of product here. But there are a couple of things that we should keep in mind here. For example, when we go to processors, you will see here there's a biomass ratio for each processor. For example, for the canneries, the biomass ratio is 0.5. That means that out of 100% of inputs, only half of it comes out as fish. So this is a, something that is worth taking note because many processors lose production uh, and when we have a decrease in biomass. If we go to the, the, to the distributors, we'll see that for frost trucks, they, it's, it's very low. This, this biomass ratio corresponds to how much of the production they're actually moving, right? And now let's go into the, 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 the links. If we look here, we can see, for example, that uh, half of the trucks of the cannery, oh, I'm actually noticing that there's issues with who's doing what. So canneries to trucks, that's 0.5, but ABC to regional, this is 0.15. Oh, this is where the magic happens. So again, I was not careful. And when I was uh, copy pasting my, my table, I did not pay attention of what I was copying where. So let's, let's do this. Okay, so when everything fails, go back to basics. So ABC is 0.15 and foolish to trucks, 0 0.5, foolish to fresh fish. So why can't you just copy it across? Oh, because I made a mistake and they're not following the same. I, I can Order. sort this out. The, okay. I would, yeah, I'm just showing that mistakes happen. <laughs> so, yeah. Never. Never? It happens to all Never. of us, really. Never. Oh. You see, you're distracting me again and now I'm writing stuff there. Ah! One. Oh no 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 no! This is Billy. You are. Yeah. Yeah. Helpful. No, no. Helpful. Very in, helpful. In, incredibly helpful. <laughs> okay, so now we have all the biomass ratios back, and now let's go to the value ratios. And for that, let's just. The only one that has a value, a direct value, is is. Oh, come on is this one, but we can now hide this so that we can get an idea of the other ones. So for canneries to trucks, we're saying that it's a 1.9. So coolers, this is three. Three. Santiago, I think you added a zero to the 
value per ton for the ABC regional compared to you, what you had on your spreadsheet. Thank you for catching that. Yeah, and uh, uh, mm, right. I've made a mistake again. Mm -hmm. No, this is it. Let's see from primary processors to coolers and points. Oh, I've made a ton of mistakes. Okay, one more time. 1.9 coolers. Fish one versus five. Facing plants, six plus trucks, 2.3. Primary processors, oh, fresh fish to fish one versus two. Yes, Okay, so now we have some numbers here. Let's run the value chain again. Okay, so we, we can run this. Oh, wait, wait a second. You will see the biomass ratios for everything now appears there. For the processors, now we know that, for example, in the you know the pelt industry, you, you, you lose a lot of biomass because you are only looking for the fur. So it's okay to have a very low biomass ratio for your canneries around 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that's all right. Freezing plants, it will depend on what kind of cut they're doing for the fish. If they are just doing, for example, a headed and gutted fish, uh, around 0.8 would be okay. If they're doing fish fillets, that would be around 0.6. Uh, and then we have, or from 4, 0.4 to 0.6, depending on the species. And for primary processors, uh, 0.7 is just a random number. Uh, that's depend on the kind of cut that they do. For example, if it's a portion, it'll probably be less. If it's a fillet, it'll probably be around 0.6. If they're just cutting the heads of the fish and, 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 and sending that to the next bit, that's probably 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So these are the kind of things that, that, that you need to double check. But you will see that now that wholesalers like they, they are all having like a, a, a one biomass ratio. And this is close to what it, to reality, but like it's important to keep note that there are losses in every part of the, of, of the chain due to products being crushed, products being misplaced, issues with the, 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 I know the, the refrigeration of some trucks, some ex, experts not, not, not going through. So like, it's important to, to, to keep in mind that these biomass ratios of one are not necessarily okay. But when we go to the value chain again, we can look at where we, let's just run it and aggregate it first. So with this, we can look at the different companies and now we have better understanding of how much they're making, but look at this process in the canneries are already losing money. So this is a red alert. And these are the kind of things that we need to, to figure out. Why are the canneries having Ne negative profits. It, it, that might be because their multipliers are their bio bio their value ratios are too low for the next part of the of the uh, chain. So, like as they go through distribution, or that their value ratios or like the the off vessel prices that that they are you the price that they are purchasing the fish is way too high. And, and, and those kind of things are, are worth noting. Another thing that might be changing things a bit is the, is, is the input output ratio. If you were to have a higher input output ratio, that might mean that you're making more products and, and hence you are, you're, you're making more money. This is typical. And, and you will get this kind of things all through your value chain as, as, as you are putting more and more information on costs and, 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 and everything. But it's, it's important to keep track on the why. And when you show this to people, they'll say, ah, it's because you missed that there is 
a byproduct that the cannery sell to a reduction industry and they make fish meal out of fish guts and and they say sell that part of the biomass for a lower price but they make about and some some canneries do those kind of things and they recover a, a bunch of money so these are the kind of things that, that, that we need to keep track of if you look at the <coughs> as, a, as the value chain tutorial you also see that there is a bit of a cost structure for some of the groups uh, particularly for the for the producers so like we can input those two and just to keep in track so it's four one three four five yeah oh let's see ah uh, so i made a mess here again so four one three let's copy it in bits What did I do? Okay, there's there goes one. And then we have oh, it was okay. No, oh, typical. Okay, so now what have we done here? We've added some costs for some, some, some information on the cost structure of the different producers. So you will see the first thing that they have, sanders and trawlers have an energy subsidy of $1 per ton. That's a huge thing. Uh, and this will reduce their, 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 their fuel costs, which, which as you can see here, their energy costs tend to be the highest costs that they'll, the highest item in their cost structure. Uh, you will see that I have um, included a male and female worker share. So they are not being, the, the way I'm, 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 I'm paying them is not to a fixed amount, but rather a percentage of the profits. Uh, then we have information on the capital costs. So this means that for a bait boat, uh, each ton, like for each ton of fish that is caught, they spent $5 in terms of capital investment. Again, this is way too high. For energy costs, we we have ten dollar per ton. Like if, if this was the case, this this fishery wouldn't last long. Uh, and 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 then we we have monitoring costs. And for example, here we have some 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 fleets that have some monitoring going on, and that the coverage is a hundred percent. You can tweak this so that it's 0.8 of all of the whole fleet, and 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 you can tweak things a bit. All the way back here, you'll see that we have not included any taxes here because uh, Anchovy Bay is completely against taxing their, their, their fleets. And then we have some information here on the number of female workers and male workers. And we have, for example, here that we have 0.5 uh, people per ton that are employed in, in what is this, in the Saners, but at the same time that it's 0.01 women per ton. So this is the way that you can incorporate some, some, some differences in terms of, 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 of gender. And you can also twitch a bit the prices or the, 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 the salaries that they would be getting or the shares. So let's say that this is a classical uh, sexist industry and they pay 10 for each 15 that they pay a, 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 a male worker. Right, so these are the kind of things that we, that, that we can start including here. And when we run the value chain, we will get now a lot more information for the producers. Let's, write, let's run this by feet uh, to get this straight away, right? So for example, if we look at sealers, now we know that sealers are losing money because something of our cost structure does not fit. Uh, they their costs are way too high, or the value of the of the of the fur is not high enough. But we know uh, how many jobs it creates. It takes just one person here, according to our structure. Uh, for trawlers, we're employing fifty eight men, and for saners, we're employing two women and eighty men. And and we can get an idea of the average salaries, which here would be a hundred and one euros per year. Which again, this is this is very uh 
and sustainable. Uh, and we can get information about everything that goes through the chain. Again, I, I've noticed here that we have negative profits in the processing. And if we go to the, um, if we run this as an aggregated thing, and we look at the canneries, well, the canneries are the ones that are screwing up with our system. So we have now negative profits in the canneries and negative profits in the, in, in the sealers, right? So, so now let's go to the, to the landings here. Let's say that the sealers are paying the price that we've got, but when we are shipping the, this to the next thing, this value per ton is, is, a, is very little. So let's say that it's now 50. What will that do? When we run the value chain again. And let's go to ABC. Now ABC does not make a negative profit, but what about sealers? Sealers are still making negative profits. Why? That might be because their cost structure is way too high. So let's say that their monitoring costs are too high. Let's say that they're 0.5 and uh, their capital cost is one because they only need like clubs. So now what happens when we change those prices? And we again- So Chago, are you changing the value for, for anchovy pay? This is based on years of research. Of course, I know. But the kind of things that we will see is that, it, again, it's, it's important to play around with things and see which components of the cost income structure have an impact. So you can start going and teaching and teaching things until it makes sense. And this is kind of like the thing that we will do with, with, uh, with stakeholders when we meet with them. We will tell them, oh, but like we have a negative profit here. This makes little sense. And they'll check their numbers and say, no, it wasn't two, it is four. So let's go back here and say that for sealers, actually, they have a share which is 20, not 50. They cost the, what they pay to their people was exaggerated. So now when we run this again and we go to the sealers, they are making money, right? They're, they're, they have positive profits. So these are the kind of like iterations that we need to go through. And it's okay that we, that we get weird numbers along the way because it's, it's, it's part of, of what we do. I suggest that you try this on, on, on your own and, and, and see if you, if you spot differences every time you add more data and what kind of difference they're getting. Again, this is incredibly simple. Uh, and the more data you have, the more you can ground your, your, your model into something serious. But Anchovy Bay is very, very malleable for all of our interests. So for the time being, I think we're kind of okay. Do you guys have any questions? I can't see any faces right now, so please. Well, maybe yeah. one question would be, when you're setting this up, mm -hmm. uh, you can populate uh, most of it just with ratios. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will, that will give you the cost structure and what happens to the amount of the landings, but not the jobs. You, for jobs, mm -hmm. you do need to, to put in some values. Of course, yeah. Yeah, and, and that, when you look at, sorry. Go no, ahead. no, yeah. You, you, you will also need that for dependence, for example. If you need to know how many, how many people depend on each worker to, to, to estimate that, the, the value chain will also do that. Yeah. yeah. And when you're looking at, uh, say, in the flow chart, you can have these ratios for how, how, uh, what comes in and uh, what goes out, the ratio between out and in. Mm -hmm. uh, but for given so for each enterprise, you have the option of either using those ratios or going in and putting numbers for all the different components or, or the relevant components of mm -hmm. it. So once you have information about so, so it's quite flexible in that sense. You don't need all the data that you talked about. Yeah. Um, now, one part of this is also that you are, as you mentioned last time, um, here we calculate the contribution to GDP from 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 uh, what happens all the way throughout the, the fishery sector, and 
Uh, for Peru, for instance, the um, the restaurants there that you included were only the seafood restaurants. Mm -hmm. But um, how do you, for for things like a seafood restaurant, figure out what's the contribution of seafood compared to? I mean, they sell a dish, and this has lots of different things in it. Yeah. So one of the things that we we did was really ask uh, the, the the chefs and the managers about those kind of things. And for example, if, if it's, uh, let's say, if it's a ceviche, ceviches are, was one of the most common ways we could sell fish in Peru. And it is just fish that is caught into cubes and you add some limes and some chili and some onions and maybe, I don't know, some veggies. And that we would ask what's the, how much of, of, of each component is the cost or like, what do you spend in fish versus you spend in, I don't know, sweet potatoes, right? For this dish. And then you would get an estimate of what was the markup that, that they needed uh, for it to make the dish profitable. And in some cases, it was a margin of 15%. But they would say that, but we sell this at a much higher rate because we have other components of, of, of cost structures that we're paying. And we also need to tailor to certain, certain uh, guests or whatnot. And they would include a different multiplier, right? But yeah, you can separate what bit of it goes by detailing what what are the components of the cost and let's say like the creativity or the the the, the chef's capacity to, to 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 or like its report. I don't know that is not included directly. Yeah, it's just uh, the, what, what multiplies to the, the 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 fish and like that is for example the reason why we couldn't trace a lot of the the fish in restaurants that weren't seafood restaurants. So like, for example, we have uh, lots of Asian restaurants in Peru and some are sushi bars and those we can track. But if you are selling um, Szechuan food uh, and some dishes use fish, we, we, we didn't really know what, what, what component of the profits came from selling fish. So we only focus on restaurants whose whole uh, system was, 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 was seafood related. So yeah, our restaurant contribution might be underestimated. I don't know if I answered that really properly. That's, you explained that well, yeah. Marta? Yeah, thank you, Santiago. Very interesting to see how, how it works for real. I just had a question, a generic question. If uh, for some of these links, you know that the process is there, but you don't know the exact numbers, what would you suggest us to do? Would you suggest us to guess something? Or would you suggest us to leave it out? What is the the best way to approach the uncertainty in this case so for example if you have some stuff that you have no information about i would leave that in like open like for example taxes right we if there is a if you have no information about how the country is taxing that industry maybe you don't add information there if you have similar systems and in, in, in similar countries that have similar policies maybe you can tra transfer some values but like for example certain fish species will like if the technology is similar they will have similar input output ratios like for for let's say for for canning tuna right it's highly unlikely that you will have a, a, an input output ratio for the canning process that exceeds 0.6 right it, it, in some cases it might be up to 0.66 but it's weird that it'll go above that right so that kind of things you can check by looking at at, at um is the specifications of some lines of production and, 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 and like even like the machines that canneries use to can the food will have some, some specifications of that sort. So a lot of it is just understanding the process behind it, right? Like for example, in, in, in fish meal production, it's very highly unlikely that if you have, uh, if you're concentrating the, num the amount of proteins in an anchovy, that you will have something that is below four. If you have something below 3.8, you've exceeded the amount of protein in the anchovy. So like there are some, 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 some bottom and, and, and top controllers that you can add. But there's a lot of information about this, but it's just not the kind of information that fishery scientists have like available. Or like if we were thinking about ecology, we're not thinking about like the input output ratio of a freezing plant, right? So it, it, it just takes some time to get adjusted and, and, and seeing where this information is coming. But Interviews are easy to, to, to go through this. Uh, like for example, uh, in, t in, the, in, in the case of Peru, we had some information about 
how much uh, canned production was 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 we, we were having per year and we knew how much we were exporting but we did not know how much of it went to supermarkets versus to small stores right and 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 we just went and surveyed a bunch of of, of, of supermarket owners and asked them about how many cans they purchase per year per store and and that informed us to get a, a ballpark estimate of that right so if you can approximate this through interviews that works really well if not you can approximate from information that happens elsewhere but like i'm not sure if like the norwegian input output ratios for a particular product would be equivalent to the brazilian ones if you have like completely different lines of production right if in one if it's labor intensive versus the other is technology intensive right so we have to be aware of of, of the kind of transfers that we're doing between those values thank you yeah no, that makes a lot of sense so you have some expectations and then some things that probably don't travel well with between mm. systems do you have uh, any um, online database or um, yeah, open source uh, um, source of information that you that you sometimes use that you can share with us. So I like for for Peru, I do have a lot of information because uh, I've been mining the government data sets for quite some time. Uh, but uh, for for other countries, uh, I, I don't have a lot of, inform of information for the input output ratios. But uh, recently, I, I, I found out that FAO has this uh, project called UFISH, which gives you information about the, the um, edible yield of certain fish species. So that is, 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 is something that, 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 that can help a bit. And like, you, you shouldn't expect to get uh, an, a yield that exceeds that for, for example, some fresh fish, right? Or like from fr some primary processors. If you are, if you know that they're doing filets, uh, but also uh, it, the the more you, you you look at this different uh, products or, 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 or lines of production, uh, certain cuts you, 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 of, of of fish will will be kind of standard, right? For like for example, the the most common common cut in in, in freezing is headed and gutted fish. Right then, there's also like butterfly cut or or just headed or just gutted. So, if you know a bit of, of, of that, you have expectations of how much is the loss if it's fifteen percent, thirty percent, or or whatnot. But uh, yeah. And there are a number of databases. Oh, yeah, databases for companies for how they are doing with uh, mm -hmm. uh, how much they how much they buy, how much they sell, the pricing, and and so on. That's that is somehow available and sesk you had a question related to this yeah i was wondering how how easy it is to get information from companies how willing are they to provide um sell sales information and things like that so if if there are many companies in one in, in one industry it's easier for them to share information than if there's just like two or three if there is like only one supplier of, I don't know, Patagonian toothfish in a country, it's highly unlikely that they'll like to share this because it's like their trade secrets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if, if there are a bunch of companies, it, it, it comes really easy. And there's ways to go around the information, right? You don't need to ask them exactly what's the value of, of, of fuel that you that you are, 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 are paying. Uh, for per ton right it's like you can approximate things like uh out of your cost the, your cost structure what percentages of that would that be fuel and and they'll tell you like 20 percent, and they'll you'll ask and like what what's your margins like uh, for profits is it around 15 percent, 20 percent uh i've heard that in the canning industry is around 20 percent. is it the same as in the fishing industry and like when when you start talking about things uh like they they'll they'll give you indirect information about their system a lot better than if you are asking directly like it's 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 the way you ask these things matters it's like asking someone to, to uh -huh. render their, their dirty laundry but in in general i think that that many people along the value chains and like for example the wholesalers or or, or the retailers and even the, the the fishers will will see the opportunity of talking to you 
as an opportunity to to share their experience and i've noticed that they 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 really like talking to you and like for example even like in canada i once went to to to, to visit a, a a fish farm for salmon and they were so proud of what they were doing that they they just told us everything and like it was like in in, in a 15 minute walk around i had enough to populate a value chain right mm -hmm. and, and and like i've i've had similar experiences in like for example uh with fish meal plants and fish meal plants in peru are seen as bad guys in by many But like they were so proud of the work that they were doing that they would really be open to sharing information. And, It's interesting. And, and yeah, so I, I think that the, the best way to go about it is just being talking to them and 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 and, and letting them know how their data is going to be used. That also matters a lot. If they if they think that you can single them out, then they won't be able to share the information. Mm -hmm. But if okay. you are telling if you are telling them like this is going to fit this in this way and this is a result I'm getting. And like the more you, you show them what you get, the more they'll be inclined to tell you uh, a more precise number, right? As soon as you get negative profits and you say like, hey, did you lie to me? <laughs> right? They'll be like, no, this is, it is like this, you, or you screwed up here or something like that. So and that, that, do, they ever, do they ever ask for the, the so a return on this? So how to, so um, a counsel from how to improve or where they have, Some some margin that they could improve, because I'm I'm thinking that this model, these kind of models, could be used as well to improve the cost benefit of the of the companies in a way. And I don't know if they ask about the outputs or not. But so when I've shared the information uh, back with them, they've always uh, enjoyed understanding how their companies are 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 placed within the larger spectrum. I, I think that for them to cut costs in particular things. They, they they require more specific models that are tailored for that kind of optimization. But for example, if we if we find that they're 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 let, 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 I don't know like I I imagine that if I am comparing the 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 cost structure of a fleet in Peru versus in in, in Ecuador and they're both uh, fishing for tunas and and there's a subsidy in in Ecuador but there's no fuel subsidy in Peru. That that information might be be useful for them to argue. Oh no, but like we deserve a fuel subsidy to to compete, right? But like I've honestly never gotten to that point with them yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, two things. Uh, one is following up on something Mart asked about getting information. Um, if you are considering building a value chain, then the experience that will come even from the Anchovy Bay tutorial is going to be helpful. And for building a, a value chain, I think the best advice is exactly the same advice as for other kind of for the other parts of the ecosystem modeling. That is, make the don't worry about the data. First, worry about the structure and the questions you're going to be asking of the models. And uh, for the value chain, that would mean build a value chain early in the project not don't wait till you have all the data uh, a rough estimate would say that 80 percent of the insight come for 20 percent of the work and it's, it's it's initial that initial those initial steps where you set it up and you get an overview of it will tell you a lot about what's important and and what's not important and that guides where you need data It's the important part of it. That's that's why you need the data. So that's one aspect of this. Another, I think, that's um, worth uh, thinking about if you're going into this direction is that economists tend to not be very interested in, in these value chains. Uh, they'll get by by having a very rough structure of them. And one part of that is, well, One part of it is, at least in my view, is that all economists are really uh, have this Nobel Prize and to get in their views and to get that Nobel Prize, you have to invent new things and you have to come up with new theories and so on. Things like getting data and, and so on, there are, very few, there are very few that really are interested in those parts. That's way too mundane. That's not fair, but uh, this year is about data. It really is, and fishery scientists love data, so that maybe that's why we like to build these value chains too, as fishery scientists. But um, one 
factor that they will put forward is that, um, well, if you know, if this is not really important because if there wasn't fish, they would just be selling chickens instead. Yeah, but they are selling fish, so being able to populate this and show the importance of fish tells you something about the fishery sector. I don't care if it can be replaced with... Actually, I do care. I don't want to see that I can only get chicken when I go to a restaurant. I prefer to go to a seafood restaurant, you know, and that's many, many people uh, would express that. So uh, this substitutability is one of the uh, key factors that comes into this. Santiago, you, you've had to deal with, uh, with, with these questions. What's your view on this? So there's a bunch of things that are important here, uh, like imports are, are, are also a big thing because when you when you have your value chain, you are accounting for, for what's coming from your system, but you might be exporting a big part of it and getting a lot of the food that you consume locally through imports. So what's the importance of having imports here? But like, honestly, uh, there's so much that you can learn by actually following the chain that that whenever you're running a multiplier which is what economists tend to do they'll, they'll say that okay the, the multiplier for peru is 2.9 and and like for every ton of fish that you land you'll make for every dollar that you make you'll make 2.9 throughout the system and like if you look at the the i know the the animal husbandry industry for chickens and like the multiplier is 2.77 so like okay it's it, it makes sense that there there's people that are making a profit in, 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 in the seafood sector, right? But those multipliers tend to be incredibly generic to the and, and, and super aggregated. So the one that we have in Peru, is, is, it is 2.9, right? But it's 2.9 because 85% of our landings are anchovies, right? But everything else has very different multipliers than 2.9. So I've, I've noticed with these kind of things, uh, when, you, when, when I was talking to people that were working in the Chesapeake Bay, that the, the, the value chains that were developed for using like economic multipliers for the states were completely unrepresentative of the small scale fisheries that we were having uh, in, in the Chesapeake Bay. So when we translate one into the other, it, it, it makes really little sense. Here, the, 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 the avenue of like doing this grunt work and this legwork is incredibly gratifying. For me, first of all, you put a face to a number, right? And, and, and all, you also build a bridge to the people that you're trying to to influence in a way, like you're creating information so that people can make better decisions. And, and if they're aware of the data gaps and they're aware of the information there, it, it, it's, it's helpful for them as well. So I would say 100%, it's important to, to keep this here. And the, the issue with substitu substituability, <laughs> ah, it's all mouthful. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's important to keep track of things. Like I, I've been looking at, at, at how much value it, it, it takes to feed, uh, to, to fully fulfill our nutritional needs with anchovies versus with chicken. And we can probably substitute our stuff with chicken, but it'll cost twice as much for the locals, right? So we can ask who's making the money and who's benefiting from this kind of interactions just by having these chains. Uh, and there's a question by Bia on how do we account for fish misidentification? Uh, and when, when we're working in model world, uh, I guess we, we, we do assume that we know the fish that we have and how it flows. And to be fair, uh, many companies are completely aware of what they're buying. They keep very detailed information on, on, on the identity of the species. Uh, there, and, and, and that will vary from, 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 from country to country. But in, in general, like you will like, for example, canneries, that, that have a very mechanized system of production, the size of the fish will, will, will let you know whether or not they can go through their line of production or not. Right? So they, they, they keep a great track of, of what they're purchasing. Uh, restaurants as well, uh, it, 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 it seems that the, the, the misidentification comes at the side of the consumer rather than at the side of the restaurant. The restaurant knows that they're buying mullets, but that they're selling grouper, right? but the consumer does not know that when they're at the at the restaurant right so w the way we deal with it is we 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 assume that that what is flowing that that we know what is flowing through our through our chain this is an assumption here though and but we can change 
the 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 flows from 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 the producers along the value chain and we can see what's what what's the the what could we be what is the excess profit that we're generating by lying or what's the uh um, yeah that kind of thing I'm, I'm i'm working i'm also working right now with with unreported catches to estimate what part of 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 our of our value comes from catches that we are not accounting for so like we we, we can do this along the the, the the value chain as well thank you santiago and uh now for general information uh, Santiago told me yesterday that uh, we would do this tutorial in half an hour. I lied. Uh, you under exaggerated. Is there anything called that? What's the opposite? Of exaggerated. I'm not quite sure. That's the problem. We hardly any native. English. I don't see any native, hardly any native English speakers here. The Americans don't count. Good. Uh, minimized, says the native American speaker. I think. All right. Um, we have forty-five minutes left, and uh, in uh, in Santiago's uh, lecture last Thursday. He uh, had a few slides about the fleet dynamics module in uh, in EWE, and uh, that's one of these obscure modules that's uh, been around for at least fifteen years, uh, which really hasn't been used for anything serious. Um, that may change now because the fleet dynamics actually feeds into what Santiago is working about with. Uh, you've heard that he's built uh, value chains for Peru for different years. An interesting question is why were the changes? Uh, what was behind those changes? And you'll hear later about a related um, aspect of, of this work here in the form of uh, fishing policy optimization, where we go in and we see how can we modify the fisheries in an ecosystem so as to optimize certain objectives. Now, in those, when we do that, the assumption is the fleets they grow and the effort, gr not the fleets, the efforts grow, and they uh, they change based on the resources. But just like with industry uh, uh, in in the value chain. Even the, the fishing uh, fleets don't just change like that. You actually need boats and you may have to build boats. And that's what the fleet dynamics module deals with. That is, it has capacity as a component and models capacity and how that changes over time in addition to how effort changes. So it puts some constraints on it. And uh, generally that's something we don't deal with in fishery science. Uh, but it actually is an important aspect when you're trying to understand what happens in the structure here. And you could very well have that those uh, restrictions there on capacity uh, that you consider that not just for the fishing fleet as we'll be talking about today, but also for the other parts of the sector. Uh, as uh, Santiago was talking about when he talked about how the uh, the means of the sardines of Peru led to the industry that had the capacity changing to uh, horse mackerel and, and other uh, species that could be used. But the whole idea about looking at the um, not just the fish and the effort and, and mechanistically move them through, but actually thinking about capacity is an important aspect of this. So with it in mind, we are now going to be um, updating the Fleet Dynamics module in EWE, an ecosystem especially, uh, and uh, doing it so that it will be more versatile. I prepared a tutorial that is on the website, which interestingly enough uh, is called Tutorial 9, even though it's Tutorial 10, so that's a good start, isn't it? Uh, but um, the tutorial there is uh, is pretty long, and we won't be able to get through that in in the half hour or so that we have. 
So what I'm intending to do instead is to open up uh, the best ecosystem model there is uh, and um, look and demonstrate to you how we work with the Fleet Dynamics module. And then uh, I will encourage you to go through the uh, tutorial on your own. It will make you think about something that goes beyond just the pure uh, biology, ecology, species interactions that we generally are dealing with, just like the value chain at its perspective from any uh, this uh, thinking about the, the capacity in the fleets and, and the consequences of changes in capacity is useful. So um, what I would like you to do, Santiago, oh, mm -hmm. I like, like giving orders here, <laughs> is we're going to go and open up Ecosim. Okay. Any scenario will do. All right. We'll do that from up there, yeah. And in Ecosim, you go and you go straight to output. Oh. And you run Ecosim because we want to know what's in the model. And this looks like a fine unfitted model. So let's go and have a look at vulnerabilities. Ecopart in oh. Ecosim input vulnerabilities. Oh. oh, okay, here we go. Yes, no, that's fine because we are just going to use it with default. And that's what I suggest for a tutorial because then we won't have any questions about, oh, I'm getting 6.4, but I'm getting 3.6. Why is there a difference? This way here, it's, it's more likely to be the same. All right, uh, that's about it. Let's go and run Ecosim. Again, go back to run Ecosim. You don't have to run it, but let's clip show multiple runs. Then let's go and look at effort, fishing effort. Oh. So Ecosim input fishing effort. We'll see what's in here. That's nothing right now. So we, we're doing this without effort. That's why the things were flatlining and we saw the increase in whales and decrease in seals due to biomass accumulation. This is fine. Now it's time to do some um, fleet dynamics. So we go Ecosim input Ecosim parameters. It doesn't have to be logic. And here you find this little check mark for fleet effort dynamics. So let's run that. Uh, we go back to run Ecosim and we run again. Very different. Actually, uh, can you just get rid of show multiple runs and run it once more? You saw it was very different. You go up now to uh, click show multiple runs again. So we, just, so we keep it. So let's see what it has done. You see, it's a... Uh, uh, well, actually, we could have compared, but, but you remember from before how whales, how much they increased. And now, of course, you see they are not increasing very much anymore. And the reason for that is that we are fishing their prey. So, so they come to equilibrium much earlier now than they did before. And the prey could, for instance, be anchovy, uh, if you click that one. That one goes down. Mackerel is another one they're eating. You see, this is the big reason is mackerel goes down quite a lot. So uh, let's go and see what has done the, the fleet dynamics module now, just by going to fishing effort, input fishing effort. No, I want to see the, uh, not, yeah, oh, actually we could, um, so here we see that they continued fishing seals throughout uh, because Nobody's telling them to stop the, the calling. Uh, the big change here is bait boats, number four, and number five, shrimpers. So we are fishing a lot of baits and we are fishing a lot of shrimpers. It looks like, at least from this, um, that there's a big increase in, in these boats. Now, what the, what the program is trying to do now, and we're going to go in and look at the details in a few minutes. This is just to illustrate that uh, what happens if we just use default values. Uh, it's uh, clearly increasing the um, effort for, for these fleets here. That, but let's go and see one thing more. Back to one Egosim and go up to data to plot. 
and let's make it value absolute and run it again. Whoa, uh, it has, this is drastic. This is a shrimp, so it has changed the system. Anchovy Bay has now become a shrimp. Very little on anchovy. Could you? Yeah, I was, I, I think I'm gonna I run it the... without this, just to show the, the difference. No, no, but there's, there's no difference now because the, you oh, have a, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, effort is... the fishing effort stays uh, mm -hmm. where it was. You have to go and reset fishing effort. Yep. Okay. Should I do that or, or do you want to continue? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I want to fin find out what is going on here. Okay. Uh, so, so the first thing I would look for would go to Ecopart input fishery off vessel price. Oh, that's why things have changed quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, it's because of the big value for shrimpers. This is much bigger than what we had in uh, mm -hmm. in my version of the model. So it has really changed it into it. If you try to uh, make shrimpers 1700 instead. Yeah, and then we go back and we run it again. Oh, we still want, no, we don't need, yeah, we, I still would like to see the data to plot. Value absolute. Oh, yeah, this is more mm -hmm. like it, uh, what we would expect. And uh, anchovy is now, it's caught anchovy, it's uh, shrimp, the top one, and the bottom one caught, and then anchovy, that's, that's where the value is now. So let's look at what it has done, why it has done this. We can go to uh, over on EcoSim input fleet site size dynamics. Now the fleet dynamics module is described in the user's guide and in the tutorial you will find that description slightly updated. Um, and we will over the next weeks here uh, improve also on what you see here. The, there are some, some limitations to, to this, but um, we have um, some factors here. The first uh, effort response power, uh, it's a function that says something about how, um, how the fishing fleets, individual boats, how good they are at picking up what happens and, and making investments. So the higher this is, the um, is it the more equal or is it the opposite? Let me just the higher this is, the more equal uh, things would be. So they would, the fleet will react uh, more, um, invest at the same time, do the same things. The next one, initial effort. Um, divided by capital capacity. That is a factor that says something about what happens in, in our baseline, in our, when we start the EcoPart model, when we start EcoSim. So in the baseline situation, we have an effort, but, we, uh, but what is the capacity? How much would it be able to expand at that point? So our default here is 0.5, which means we will be able to double effort without building new boats. You'll see what the impact is of that. The next capital depreciation rate is 6%. Uh, it's typically is in that range, 4 to 10%. Mm -hmm. And 6% means that uh, well, it will be something like uh, 15, 20 years uh, when you have assets that they last for 15 or 20 years. Um, or when you have investments. It's, it's this kind of number, 6% depreciation every year. And then the, the last one here, 20%, that's how much uh, capital growth that can be from one year to the next. So these, uh, these are the parameters that everything here is, is based on. Now, we can leave it at this and then um, because there's, 
Now actually, let, let's go let's just go back and look at fishing effort. I'll give you one example. So when you look at this, for instance, the bait boats, you can see there that in, in a matter of uh, 16 years, they have built up to seven times. If we go back to uh, the um, fleet side dynamics, and we can take that capital, uh, initial capital at growth rate for sailors and for bait boats, that's the two that fish anchovy. And uh, we could bring that down to 0.05 or something like that. So now can only 5% investment per year and the one above it as well. They can max grow with 5% per year. And we just do another one. It didn't grow as much. So let's go back and look at the fleet effort again. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and you can see here uh, now you have a much slower change in effort. We can't see what happen, uh, what happens to capacity, but but they are closely linked. Um, it matters less how you change the if we go over again to to uh, fleet side dynamics. The one there about initial effort divided by capital capacity. If we move that up to 0.9 for, for, for number three and number four, that would mean that 90% of the capacity was used as effort when we start off. Let's run again. I expect that this will have less impact because we're building new boats. We hardly saw any change here. Let's go and have a look at uh, yeah. how it looks. For, yeah, we can't really, this, this, it's not very sensitive to this factor here. Uh, shrimpers, if you look at those, we see they only build up to 1.7 or 8 times. Ah, now why can that be? Why don't it, just like in the real anchovy bay, grow the shrimp effort much more? Well, um, for that, uh, let's go and look at let's go and look at on output ecosim fleet plots. Mm. This is a new thing that uh, came in because of um, because of all the work in Europe about discards, shrimpers. So you see the uh, no, you can't really see it well here, but you see the uh, fishing that they are causing on shrimps make the shrimp F increase from 0.6 to one. one. Yeah, we'll actually get the same picture in this case here from going to a better picture from Ecosim group plots. And shrimp. Oh. Yeah, we only want to get rid of, of those. We only want nine more. Yeah, that's much better. Shrimp. Now you see shrimp biomass declines not very much from 0.8 to 0.7. Fish mortality increases. Now that decrease there, even a slight decrease from 0.8 to 0.7. Oh, let's look at it for, for, for macro anchovy as well. So uh, macro decreases somewhat and white uh, anchovy. Now anchovy is actually remarkably stable here. Now what I'm getting is uh, is when um, when, for instance, for shrimp, the uh, when for shrimp the uh, biomass decreases. That means the catch per unit effort decreases, right? That's a, a fair assumption. Um, that means that when they go fishing, they are actually earning less because the catch goes down over time with a constant effort. If effort was constant, no. As they are building the fleet here, doubling their fleet is not constant. They each of them make less money because cats per unit effort goes down. Make sense? That's what happened. 
there is an app for that. No, there is not an app for that, but that's what we often say. There is a way of addressing that question in EWE. For this, we have to go to Ecosim input group info. And I'll explain this. There is something, a very, very long title here, but not the longest. It's the third but last. It's called density dependent catchability. This deals with catchability. Now, catchability is the way catchability is uh, is implemented is basically that cats equal a the catchability times something. That's you know that's catchability is something that enters in when we calculate the catches, and catchability is. Uh, something that's used in all models that deal with fishing. Such a catchability coefficient is not constant, especially not for schooling fish. Uh, there are two things that, gives, that will give us a problem, assuming that catchability is constant. Schooling fish, you know, they, they know when the last macro uh, school in the 60s was caught in the North Sea and it took 20 years before they saw any again. Because of the schooling, it's easier to find them. The fishermen might spend, boats may spend, uh, spend more time searching for it, but when they find them, they, they are still very efficient. So, so that can lead to a higher catchability. Another factor is if we have range contraction in, uh, for, for a group. Range construction is what made the uh, cod on the east coast of Canada collapse. That as they fished down the cod back there in the 70s or whatever it was around that time, um, cod aggregated or con co the, the range, the distribution of cod contracted into more favorable areas. And that meant the fishermen still saw a big catch per unit effort even as the total abundance of um, cod decreased. There was a more favorable habitats that were uh, occupied. So fishermen could find them. If you look just as catch per unit of effort, it remained high until it collapsed. This factor here is really important for fleet side dynamics and for models in general. We haven't talked about it. But um, when you have range contraction, when you have schooling fish, this is a factor that is important. So we can see what the effect is of this if we, uh, for instance, for anchovy and mackerel and uh, let's try shrimp to put in their uh, five. So a high. Uh, yeah, that one, that one, and so, yeah, that's it. So now we are saying that catchability will remain high as the biomass go down. So what's the consequence of this? Mm. We see some pretty drastic things there. Let's make the uh, Let's make it the go back to default value for fleet size dynamics. Mm. You know, we changed the uh, the two values, 0 0.05 over on the the last one over there, yeah. And here as well, the initial effort. Yeah, it, yeah, it, that one matters very little. So okay. you can put, it, it, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, one echo same again. See, now we're getting into, oh, there are good years and bad years for, for shrimp populations. Uh, uh, it's actually, not, maybe it's not shrimp who does it. Maybe it is actually... Anchovy. Maybe it's anchovy that, yeah. that gets us into this. But it really, what we're seeing here is... Um... Oh, sorry, Billy. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Go, go, go down yeah. to anchovy. Yeah. We're seeing, we're seeing, oh, we're seeing regime shifts almost, mm -hmm. which is caused in this case here by effort being boats being built and boats disappearing from the fleets again. 
they disappear a bit too early here, a trick mm. here, but but this is what happens here. That with when we put in density dependent catchability, we get uh, we can get to an unstable situation if investment is too quick to to mm. to, uh, to happen. You can go back to fleet size dynamics and just change the column, the last column, click on the top, just change that to 0.5. So now we're saying that a lot of people are interested in investing in uh, quick money in fisheries. Shouldn't be allowed. Mm -hmm. And it becomes even more drastic, especially there in the beginning. Uh, very early on, you see drastic changes, uh, including in now we see it including in shrimp, that uh, there's a big investment. So so a lot of lots of value in there. You can go and look at the uh, uh, group plots, and we'll see the uh, for shrimp. We should see how F changes too. Well, cats actually becomes pretty stable. Biomass go down to half. Uh, let's let's have a look at macro lentury. Okay, now we see a complete collapse of macro with this, uh, and this happens when you have um, when you have density dependent casability. So when you have schooling fish, um, one has to be really careful careful with effort. That's not no big surprise, but uh, but this is uh, what you see happening here. What happens with anchovies? Oh, the same thing. Yeah. Now um, we are doing this now with a model that's not fitted to time series, and we're doing that just because, for illustration, it makes it uh, kind of simpler. But of course, if you were do when you're doing this uh, in earnest, uh, it really is an advantage to fit the model to time series data first. So um, let's try to get back to a, a more uh, normal situation again. Let's go back to, there's no reset to default here. We'll put that in when we're doing it. We're also going to put in that you can actually see the capacity. It's not being displayed right now. Uh, then the, no, oh, where was it? Was in, Oh, here we go. We can get rid of that catchability here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, let me think. No, no, actually, I want to have some. Uh, let's let it. The catchability is actually, but we can try two instead of uh, five so we don't collapse them completely. Where go was back that to group in? info, echo same input yes. group info. Okay. And here for, for macro and shrimp, shrimp, put two. Mm -hmm. And let's go and run it again and see what this does. Yeah, and then let's look at the change data to plot to uh, to relative biomass. There we are, it's there already. So we can see there are big changes in uh, in mackerel, in uh, in anchovy. Let's see anchovy. Oh, initially it increases, and then it decreases. It's because the mackerel goes uh, really down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, cl click on the um, show multiple runs. Ah, I was going to show price elasticity. Uh, oh, you have the new version. Oh, you have the new version. I, fantastic. I did, I did my homework, Billy. Oh, fantastic. Uh, now, as explanation here, uh, this weekend here, preparing for it, it became clear that price elasticity wasn't working properly. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, then let me explain it. The thing is, we have it working now with the uh, fleet size dynamics. And, uh, and we have a version of it that does that. Should you be actually be working with this? Uh, well, it's going to be in the next release of uh, of EWE, uh, and if you need it before, 
Yes, Marta, raised hand. No, I just had a, a question regarding when you were talking about this. The, this can you hear me? Yeah. When mm -hmm. you were talking about the schooling um, fish and that that you advise to to try to check the, this parameter, the density dependence of catchability um, with a fitted model. Would you, mm -hmm. would you use it, you, would you feed your model and then use it or would you use it taking that parameter into account to see if you would feed it better? I would, uh, it's true in many, many, many models we have not incorporated this, but density dependent catchability is a fact of, it's a fact of fishing if there's anything called that. Uh, it should be considered um, and it would impact what the, what the vulnerability is setting for sure but, we've, but we've what often would be been the able best? to get by without it yeah. say what would be the best way to include it would you feed it without and then feed it with and compare um, put in a modest one maybe like this and then uh, th the problem with this is you have to explain it. When, when you, once we go in here, we have to explain it and, and we're going to have reviewers coming and harassing us afterwards. That's one reason why in many fits we haven't done it, even though we know that uh, it's, it ought to be considered for, for schooling fish. And for fish where range contraction is a major issue. Can you estimate? Um density-dependent oh. catchability from time series data? Mm, we don't have any way of estimating it, no. And uh, in principle, you could, yes, you could uh, run the model um, and just like we do, um, just like we, when, if we could, we could include it on the fit to time series yeah. as a third axis. It complicates the model quite a bit. But yeah, no, it could go into those equations there. So a plugin could do this, or we could change the fit to time series. It's just something we haven't, it's never been the right opportunity, which is the right opportunity is when someone knock, knock, knocks and says, oh, we really need to fix this. You need to do something about it and, be, and it's willing to work on it. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, what it that's what it calls for. So, um, Billy, just one, one, one question. What, what are like good ballpark estimates? Is like two moderate, five extreme? What about a 10? Like, what are we ten, talking ten, about here? We're talking about the range two, three, four, five. That's a good range for, for, for this catch. Uh, it, it matters as soon as it gets, it's, it's an exponent that comes into it and it, it matters what it is. So yeah, two is, uh, two is, uh, is, not extreme. Mm -hmm. Five or ten is much. It's definitely is extreme. Yeah, more than five times as much. So, um, elasticity. Yeah, we mentioning this is uh, I, uh, talking about density density dependent catchability is important. Um, I have two things left I want to talk about. We have. Five minutes less. So let's just quickly take, take price elasticity. The 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 thing behind this is that uh, as supply changes, demand supply changes, it may well be that the price changes too. So let's go to add. This here is just like how we make uh, mediation functions and and environmental preference functions. Do you, okay. Uh, now, uh, could you just uh, shape by hand, just to make it quick, I'm giving a, in tutorial something more. If you go uh, sh change shape, no, 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 no stop, stop. Oh, you can't do it. Okay. Yeah. Let's say cancel. I want to have that it's the lower it is, the higher to go down. So like that? Something like this. Yeah. So now, see, what we're doing now is we're saying that... Um, when supply goes down, prices go up. That's because um, that's because anchovy is of course being used for bait, and there's only that many bait tra there are many traps in anchovy bait that needs bait. 
and it's being used for putting pizzas on the restaurants uh, or anchovy on the on the, on the pizzas. So this here is the Ecopart baseline that Santiago is working with now. Where do you want it? Somewhere. Yeah, that's fine. Just drop it there. So now we're saying higher price, higher supply, lower prices, lower supply, higher prices. And you go to find supply. Uh, and here you take anchovy, the two places where you have anchovy, and you move them to the right. So now we define that it's anchovy that is the x-axis here. And y-axis is the price. Okay. So uh, y-axis is how much it changes the off vessel price. So this is what's going to happen. As the supply of anchovy changes, the off vessel price is going to be changing too. We have a, a step, next step, which is uh, seems unnecessary, but we have to do it right now. Apply price elasticity, and here you find entry, the two places for entry, and you just move it over. Take the shape on the left, yeah, and do the same for the next one. Now we can run echo semi. So now we define this function and we've applied it twice. And do you want it to go run. as in value yeah, or? No, 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 let's just leave it. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's look at one, uh, let's look at anchovy. One, 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 two. So it actually st kept it higher. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's because we were at a, let's change the, where we're at with the price elasticity. Because this ought uh, this ought to lead to um, we're only going down in uh, this ought to lead to it becoming more profitable to fish anchovy. Uh, actually, let's let's look at um, oh do we? It's because we still have the capability, I think. Oh, let's see. We haven't. We're changing a number of factors. Yeah, let's let time. let's keep this in one and see what happens. And run again. No, not much. No. Not quite sure what's going on here. Anyway, mm -hmm. in the version you have, uh, the price elasticity does not work. Not you, Santiago. The rest of you doesn't work with uh, with this fleet dynamics. Uh, that's just one thing more I want to mention before. Uh, we finished for today, and that is the calculations in here. Can you can you just uh, clear this show multiple ones? Uh, yeah. Do I run it again? Is, yeah. And then show, click show multiple ones. Now, if you go back, there's one thing more than matters. That is the go back to where we define the fleet. So, echo part input fleets, uh, echo part input fishery fleets, oh, not the very top. Oh. Echo part input. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Fleets. Yeah. There. See, uh, this here is a place where we define um, the fleets, and in here there's a default assumption about how much profit the fleets are making. Now, we could make the uh, shrimpers, for instance, much more profitable with this effort here. So if you change, you go and change the 40 to uh, to 10 instead, two times. Oh, no, what? cancel, just put where it says 40, the bottom row where it says 40, put 10. Here, sailing cost? Yeah, just enter 10. Okay. And also the effort related to. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, uh -oh. Ignore. Yeah. Let's try that one too. What effort related also 10? Yeah. Okay. Let's run it again. So See, what we're saying now is they're much more profitable. And that means that uh, we'll be able to build more uh, more uh, effort for the, for these groups or more capacity as well. Both okay. effort and capacity. Let's go here. It should matter. No. Uh... Boom, boom, boom. Um, the problem is when you don't save, I don't know anymore what, 
what parameters we have. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyway, um, anyway, this is another factor that matters, and we have now made it through the components of what's in the tutorial, not in the same order and not asking the same detailed questions as in the tutorial, but uh, we have everything that relates to uh, to what's in there now. That's basically it.